Welcome to A Girl in Concern. We're going to talk about what I consider to be the, the, the most popular boondoggle in the energy uh, sphere, uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas. Uh, natural gas is touted to be the bridge to the future and uh, all these things that it's, it's it less carbon and all these things about it that are the best. And I guess if you want to range it, it is better than the ones above it. But uh, we're going to find out a lot of reasons why the uh, uh, it's still it's still going down the same road we've been going on for uh, you know I don't know 100 years or so since since I think it was Rockefeller first realized that the petroleum the gasoline that they were throwing away from petroleum could be used for cars and uh, and it's just been downhill ever since. I have as my guest uh, Ted Gleichman, who is with the uh, Oregon Sierra Club. And uh, he's going to speak a little bit about about this uh, this liquefied natural gas. And we've done programs on this before. And exactly what you know what is a liquefied natural gas? Well, let me let me take a minute and do um, a couple of definitions. That's always um, a good way. Voltaire said, just, "Before we can talk, we need to define <laughs> our terms." And he had it right. <laughs> he did have it right because there's two different definitions for natural gas, and also two different definitions for fracking. Uh, which is where the gas comes from that would be liquefied to be exported. So before I do those, let me just say the liquefaction process is to get the gas across the ocean. Gas is not a global to market. To concentrate it. So. Yes, exactly. Uh, gas is not a global market the way oil is because oil doesn't compress. Gas is a gas. It can compress. Uh, compressed natural gas can be used in vehicles, for example. Um, but um, you really want to ship it, you use either pipelines on land or under short bodies of water, uh, or uh, you have to liquefy it to put it into huge tankers to move it across the big water. Mm -hmm. And uh, that liquefaction process takes it down to one six hundredth of its gaseous volume as a liquid. So you can, use, you can bring 600 times more. Exactly, than you could in a pipeline. Mm, I had no idea it was that much. It's, yeah, so that's it's, an it's incredible a, it's a big pressure. Issue. It's, an, it's incredible pressure. And it's a pretty incredible temperature, too. You have to take it down to minus 261 degrees Fahrenheit. Absolutely. To, Zero is like 400, isn't it's it? It's something in that range, yeah. Kelvin, um, to make it into a liquid. And then, of course, it has to be regasified at the other end to be moved in pipelines uh, and than used for households, commercial businesses, or manufacturing. And to make electricity so, from it. To make electricity, yeah. right. It's still, it's still used as a gas that way. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, it, LNG is not used directly. It has to be regasified. So there's a huge energy cost to br making it that cold and then, then bringing bring it, it back up to room temperature mm -hmm. uh, at the other end, in addition to shipping the stuff across the big water. So does that, does that freezing it and bringing it back up have a, have a carbon footprint? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, the carbon balance typically uh, applied to natural gas uh, as compared to coal is that it puts out 50 percent of the same of CO2 level, carbon dioxide level, as coal. But that's only if you're comparing it on a, um, an, an apples and oranges basis. If you really look at the entire supply chain of natural gas, the entire life cycle of natural gas, and compare it to coal, you have a lot of other issues that come into play, especially then if you liquefy it. And we'll come back to those for a minute. But I want to say two things. First, natural gas gets used a couple of different ways. And I, I had done a little quiz. Can we share our, uh, our ugly secret with the, the audience? I think, I think they're ready for it. <laughs> okay, which is that we, uh, uh, we have a PowerPoint here, which uh, miracles of high technology, uh, what could ever possibly go wrong, uh, we're not able to put up. So I have a, 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 what is natural gas? First, th these are the options. Um, a, uh, as identified by Mel Brooks in the faux western Blazing Saddles, beans plus cowboys equals natural gas. Okay. Mm -hmm. B, honey the Holstein chows down, relaxes, and says moo. C, the best rebranding in history since it was formerly known as swamp gas. D, 
turn this a little bit. We're going to try to get it with a camera and, and compensate for the... Oh, well, in that case, let me uh, well, actually go to the formal slideshow presentation here. We'll make it work somehow. Um, technically... Oh, okay, now I can do it here. The, oh, all right. All right, so... The first definition of natural gas at the wellhead and in distribution pipelines pre-refinery is a mix of gaseous hydrocarbons, predominantly methane, but al also often including <laughs> butane, propane, ethanes, and other substances like mercury and radon, and also often mixed with liquid hydrocarbons. Okay, so that's, that's option D. Let's call this wellhead gas. E, technically the second definition of natural gas, after it has been processed at a refinery or at an LNG plant, is essentially pure 100% methane with all other gaseous hydrocarbons and other substances removed and processed or disposed of separately along with a tiny percentage of rotten eggs odorant added so if you smell it you can leave your kitchen before it blows it's up. It's basically just sulfur, sulfur oxide I think. Yeah, yeah, sulfur, yeah. Hydrogen sulfide, I think, is, is, is it, one of the yeah. most, most, most common. It's, and it's like 0.15%. It doesn't take much. Mm -hmm. But the, the reason, that there's, a, there's a couple of reasons why those two definitions of natural gas are important. Um, we'll call that refinery gas. But wellhead gas and, and refinery gas have different characteristics. I mean, methane is a really elegant hydrocarbon. It's CH4, it's just one carbon atom with mm -hmm. four hydrogen, hydrogen ions hooked onto it. And when you burn it, when you apply heat to it, uh, you get heat out of it and only carbon dioxide and H2O, and a little water. bit of water vapor, which is why it's safe to use it in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. so, so methane, by, on, on that basis, is... Cl the, cl the cleanest, but in reality, now that we know what we know about carbon dioxide, um, the least dirty of the fossil fuels. It's the safest in the sense of, I mean, you don't want to be burning gasoline in your kitchen. You don't want to be burning propane or butane in your kitchen. Uh, I mean, butane lighter a little bit for a minute. You shouldn't be smoking mm -hmm. in your kitchen anyway, but you don't want to be burning other hydrocarbons um, in your kitchen. You want to be uh, dealing with those where there's plenty of ventilation because they put off a lot of other uh, noxious and poisonous substances. Methane, when you burn it, does not. And so that's why the, the, the title of this uh, theoretical PowerPoint here uh, uh, is Now You're Cooking with Gas, which is a phrase that developed in the 20s and 30s when people were able to switch from wood stoves to gas stoves. And, and away from kerosene, And too. away from kerosene, yeah. right, exactly. Um, and, and, I mean, there was a time when people burned coal in their kitchens. Uh, but the problem is that with wellhead gas, which is a mix of gaseous hydrocarbons of various stripes, not just methane, there's a lot of leakage. And so what we get as why, so why this matters, methane outgassing and leakage, it is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And um, that leads to a much more dramatic effect from methane on the climate. Uh, and the, over the, the life cycle, it's something like 20 times more potent, over the first 100 years in the atmosphere after it leaks out. Mm -hmm. Something like 20 times more potent as a heat trap yeah, than I've, carbon dioxide. I've heard 19. But, yeah, yeah the, and the, there's still a lot of science working on this. But... Um, there's a curve on that. All of these climate functions are nonlinear. And in the first 20 years, which is what really matters, uh, methane is 80 to 90 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, uh, as it, it gradually degrades in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> methane out, outgassing and leakage are a major problem, um, and it's the studies that have been done have shown that this, this totally eliminates in many cases um, or all but eliminates any advantage that there is to natural gas over any other fossil fuel. Um, it leads us to the 
the issue then of greenwashing. Uh, we get this all the time and, and you can see here green technology low gas excuse me natural gas low emission vehicle well low emission does not mean no emission and it's not as if the gas was invented inside of this uh, van right the gas had to come from a well um, mm -hmm. and and get get piped through and then processed and there was methane leakage at every step along the way along with lots of other gaseous hydrocarbon leakage. I mean, in Colorado, which is one of the, the fracking central areas right now, there is a permanent haze over the front range uh, from Denver to Fort Collins from the leaking from all of the fracked wells, just of various gases. Uh, and so the, this idea that natural gas is a clean fuel is true enough when you're scrambling eggs but it's not true when you're looking mm -hmm. at the big picture of what's happen happening to the climate. And you're not even accounting for what the chemicals are that are putting into the ground that probably remain in the ground. Well, and that's the next step, which is mm -hmm. fracking. So when did fracking start? So we've been hearing... It's pretty recent that we hear about well, it. Well, <laughs> the, the industry's been saying we've been doing it since World War II. And so, so here I have uh, uh, my, my uh, attempts at humor here. So in the Garden of Eden, after that whole serpent and apple thing, that's when we started fracking. Birds do it, bees do it, even educated fleas do it. It is the key service delivery element in the so-called oldest profession. Fracking started with teenagers, probably. Mm. Oh, no, wait. Answers A to D represent a slightly different Anglo-Saxon gerund. Perhaps this question has not been properly framed. Technically, for the first definition of fracking, which is enhanced hydrocarbon recovery through high-pressure rock formation cracking, in vertical conventional wells. That started shortly after World War II. We, so we're going to call this old fracking. The second definition of fracking is hydraulic fracturing using mixtures of water, specialty sand, other fluids and substances, many of them toxic. Many of them they won't tell us about. Right, they're all secret yeah. under the Cheney Energy Act of 2005. Pushed into horizontal shale gas rock formations, through extremely high pressure horizontal drilling techniques, developed your tax dollars at work for use at the bottom of vertical well shafts. So that started with the Afghan and Iraq wars. I mean, interesting war connection here, of course. So with, that's, with that's, not the so that's not the first Iraq war, that's the, the ones in... The new two, one. The new yeah, one the ones that's, so that's it's winding it's down. Since little over 10 less, years then. Exactly. So that's a new fracking. And the, the challenge, um, the industry will say, well, we've been fracking ever since World War II, so there's nothing to worry about. Well, we haven't been doing new fracking since World War II. We've been doing that since the turn of the century. And that is a whole different animal. That's and it's a on very a much larger creases. scale, too. And it's on a much larger scale. And uh, <coughs> so the same issues apply. Methane outgassing and leakage occurs all during new fracking. There is no such thing as a well that doesn't leak permanently. There are wells that don't leak all the time. There are wells that do leak all the time, um, where there's, there's methane coming up around the, um, the well shaft itself um, through the broken rock. I mean, when you see on, on TV, on the news shows, these, uh, it, the, the constant advertising from the natural gas industry about how good this is, uh, and that's why they have to tell us about it over and over is because it's so obviously so good. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> uh, that they show these pretty pictures of there's the nice green plants on the top of the earth, and then there's little brown topsoil, and then there's a nice th thick rock wall, and then there's a pretty little blue aquifer, and then there's another straight line uh, rock area, and then below that there's, there's a natural gas shale bed, and the pipeline goes down to that and brings up the gas, and and that's not what it looks like down there. It's messy. There's fractures. There's fault lines. Uh, stuff moves around. Fluids that's, move around. That's what gets it to come out of people's uh, uh, water tap, and then they can exactly, light it on fire. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So the industry is trying to sell us a bill of goods in terms of what fracking is and how it works. And new fracking is about as similar to old enhanced oil recovery, where they were using high-pressure fluids to crack rock that had gas in it um, as um, a cockroach is 
similar to a Komodo dragon. I mean, it's a different animal that we're dealing with now, mm -hmm. and a lot more of it, as you said. Um, I mean, Colorado now has 55,000 wells. Uh, that's just and Colorado, then. That's, and that, right. And the, the I mean, the, the Rocky Mountain sh shale gas wells have become um, a really major struggle. And the reason that's important to us is because the, the gas that would be exported through Oregon, if they get these projects done, would be coming from the Rocky Mountains. I mean, we're set up here to drain the entire western half of North America. So the, the other question... Drain it as, as a liquefied natural gas export. As, exactly. And, and people are now calling it fracked gas export as a, as a new way of, uh, of talking about it to make sure people understand, understand the connection. Mm -hmm. uh, because the original pitch was that it was going to be for import, that it was going to be for um, energy security uh, to make things better here. Um, that was a sham and a scam from the start. And they got found out from the start. It was all going to California, apparently. Well, and the need to, um, <clears throat> once, once new fracking got rolling um, in a big deal way, um, we ended up, and uh, it would be interesting to see how, well, with, and this is a little hard to see on the, on the TV screen in terms of what it says, but the, the top piece of this, gas production by source here, is uh, fracked gas, new fracked gas. Um, and it, it's showing on the screen, we can see here as, as a, uh, a mottled blue, the straight line down the middle um, is how much was produced in 2012. Uh, and, and it really didn't start until the turn of the century. Uh, and it, it's expanded dramatically, as you can see, um, to the point where by 2012, it was about 40% of total gas production. Now, the line just below that is what's called tight gas by the industry, and that's old fracking. That's the fracking that started after World War II into conventional wells uh, that where the gas was still in tight rock formations, and those rock formations needed to be broken up to pull it out. Um, and that's another 20% of, of the total. Uh, then the, the, the next line below is traditional conventional gas. You poke a hole in the ground and the gas comes up. Uh, and then um, offshore gas is the, the next to, was next to the bottom. But the, the point is that in that, it, if there's a possibility of going back in our uh, multi-control PowerPoint st structure here, yeah, the, we want to, to the, back up to that. There we, go. there we go. The big bulge that you see going across um, from left to right in that, that blue section all the way out to 2040, that is an, an anticipation that, we, that frac gas will be um, taking over, new fracking will be taking over more than half of all gas production in the United States, and that it will dramatically expand, that the growth in it uh, from today will be um, almost double in terms of gas use. Pretty and, close, yeah. And the pitch was, again, and, and still you hear this on every Sunday morning talk show, the pitch was, well, gas is our salvation. Um, it's, it's jobs, it's, it's money, it's clean. Well, it certainly is money. Uh, the yeah, US but, for, but for who? Well, the U.S. Department <laughs> of Energy did a study, and what they came up with is that it's good for the economy um, unless you happen to live off of wages or fixed income in any way. Which is most people. Almost everyone. It's good yeah. for the 1%. Basically, that's what, what they're I was saying. Yeah, right. It's good for the owners of the energy companies. The 99%. And the, and the stockholders. And the stockholders. Um, yeah. uh, and, and that's the pitch. So you'll see one of the ironies in, in, in the constant barrage of advertising on this is that they will pitch that this is energy security and energy salvation, and we're going to help our allies um, by exporting it to them uh, at the same time, which will cause prices to rise in the United States. If this is such a good deal for us, part of the concern that we have is uh, let's keep it here while we're working out how we make the conversion from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Uh, because that's the real challenge. I mean, fossil fuels have been wonderful. They gave us all of this uh, industrial society since 1750. 
but their time has passed in terms of what we need for a livable climate. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge. Uh, I, I do a thing in talking to audiences about, is everybody who hasn't used fossil fuels today raise your hand, and sometimes somebody tries and yeah. shoot them down because we all use fossil fuels every day. Even if we, we don't, have to. Even if we don't drive, I mean, they use it in chemical, they use it in drugs, they use it in just about exactly. everything. Plastics. Exactly. Yeah. So. But we have passed the tipping point. Everybody knows that this is not the climate we grew up with. Everybody knows that we are in a, a, a new situation, a new era now, and the problem is that it's, we're not getting the leadership from the political community um, as to how we can deal with that, how we can change it. Mm -hmm. um, my own view and uh, the view of, of uh, most of the member leaders and activists in Sierra Club, for example, is first do no harm. Use the Hippocratic principle, Which no, new, <laughs> no new fossil fuel infrastructure. Don't build any new pipelines. Oh. Don't build any new plants because renewables are ready to go. There's a great piece by Al Gore in a um, recent issue of, of Rolling Stone, the June 18th issue of Rolling Stone, you know. In addition to rock and roll coverage, they do one important political or economic stuff. piece per yeah. issue. And, and Gore's point is that um, in more than two dozen countries around the world, solar and wind and other renewables now are cheaper than fossil fuels in terms of the infrastructure. And they're right on the bubble here. Um, it is entirely feasible. The only barriers are political and economic. Economic not in the sense of cost, but economic in the sense of cost structure because of the way utilities pay for things uh, and the way people are forced to pay for things in terms of how they, we use energy in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. but. I, you know, I, I tease some of the renewables advocates, so those fancy blue solar panels you've got on your roof, man, the fuel for those must be really expensive, <laughs> right? Must cost you an arm and a leg mm. to, get, to get the fuel uh, delivered for those. Where does that come from, <laughs> right? And, and those fancy wind whirly gigs we've got all over the, the gorge, wow, I bet that fuel is really expensive. Yeah. Where do you get that fuel? How do you, <laughs> how do you make that happen? That must be really costly. Whereas fossil fuel costs are going up constantly. All the cheap fossil fuels have been used up. You know, that era is over. I've been arrested twice at the White House now protesting the Keystone XL pipeline. Mm -hmm. As well, we and all should. Well, it's a, I think many of us will have opportunities for those things over time. I hope so. Um, and, I, and let me just say that's on my own time. So it's not a Sierra Club thing. Um, Sierra Club does not officially support right. civil disobedience um, yet. Um, but... It wasn't cost effective to exploit and destroy the communities of northern Alberta um, to get the tar sands out of there and melt it down to turn it into a form of oil. Um, I mean, it's really a solid. It's like asphalt. It's called it's bitumen. It's barely an oil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They like to call it oil sands, but it, it does not flow. You have to burn it. Um, you have to melt it to make it into something that you can run through a pipeline. Um, uh, but that didn't work economically until oil hit $70 a barrel. And I can remember in the late 90s, I was working on a project and um, a, a brief stint uh, in corporate America when oil was at $11 a barrel. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's been a big change just oh, in the last 25 years. I can remember when I was raised, it was <laughs> 19 cents a gallon. Right. 25 cents a gallon. So. Gasoline was not something that people worried about at that point no, in time. No, it was in insignificant. Fill your tank for five bucks. But we're never going to see 70 again, much less No. Much less 11 or any other cheap, um, cheap what's, gasoline. What's it, up, what's it up to now? It's been between 100 and 110, depending on the daily news from it's Iraq. It's been staying there for a while then. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now, you know, we, we've worried a lot about peak oil, uh, the idea that we would run out. Well, what's, what it turns out is that the fossil fuel industry is inexorable in pushing for uh, any possible way. And the tar sands of Alberta are a perfect example of that. But so is the oil shale of western Colorado and shale gas. I mean, the, the pollution, I mean, we've got documented earthquakes in Oklahoma, 
in Ohio, there was one in Kansas the other day that they're suspicious about, from fracking fluids, one of the, one of the main f secret fluids that's used for fracking is a lubricant. Well, you're putting lubricants down where there are plates that shift and move, you're going to mm -hmm. make it easier for them to move around, and that's happened. So Lubricate the earthquake. Huh? Lubricate the earthquake, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, uh, thank God we don't have shale formations here for our earthquake because... But, but uh, there are some uh, sh fracking in California, though. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a Southern huge... Southern California. Monterey. The Monterey shale bed is a, a huge... Um, uh, geologic fe feature below Southern California and there's a big fight over mm -hmm. um, how much of that should be fracked. You know, and our position of course is none of it. Stop. Stop now. digging. <laughs> Stop digging, exactly. <laughs> and you get yourself into a hole. That's right, and, and, uh, and they just refuse to see the, see the fact that we're in a hole because the people that are making the money off of it are also the ones that control the media and the government. Right, right. And I don't see a way out of that <laughs> other than a very serious uh, you know, uh, crisis of some kind. I, I, That's what it takes. I think that the, um, th there is hope and, and, and reason for optimism when you look at what's going around in terms of all of the changes that people are making in their own lives on one level. And then also I think we can talk about that on, on, a, on a political level too. One of the other people arrested at the Keystone XL pipeline protests in Washington in 2011 from Oregon is a woman named Barbara Ford. Um, you should talk to her sometime here. You, uh, we should do that. She's, she's, she's interesting. I'll give she's, her contact. She's a Buddhist teacher, and she um, works with the famous Buddhist teacher, uh, Joanna Macy. Uh, and she told me that she gets asked by people what to do because they feel so guilty that they can't do everything. And her answer, and I can't do it as eloquently as, as she does, but her answer is, please, relax. Nobody can do everything. So what you should do is follow your heart, listen to your soul, do the best you can with the things that are the most important mm -hmm. to you and where you have a skill set uh, where you can make a difference. Uh, change those areas in your daily life and with your family and friends and with your work. And do what else you can do as you can. I mean, change from a bank to a credit union, do your recycling, drive less, bicycle more. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, when you change out your vehicle every 25 years, you know, get, get one that's better. I mean, do the right. things you can do. And but that, everything has to change. And so if we all do, or a substantial proportion of us do what we can do, yeah. we'll see those changes. Right. Another thing they could do is not take everything they see on the media at face value. That would be nice. You know, like some, someone like Fareed Zakaria, I think that guy's great when he's talking about uh, foreign policy. But when he starts talking about local, you know, he's all for fracking and all these different things. So, so people can see <laughs> something and still not see, you know, some of, the, some of the damage we're doing. One of the problems with the, the fossil fuel industry is that their stock price, half of their stock price is based on their proven reserves not on their annual results. And so the math, Bill McKibben of 350.org um, has done great work on this along with Naomi Klein. Um, the math is that 80% of the fossil fuels that we know about need to stay in the ground if we're going to have a livable climate in terms of how much more we can burn. Mm -hmm. Well that means that if you think the subprime bubble from the rape of the housing market was bad, the fossil fuel bubble in our economy is even bigger because every oil company stock value should drop by 50% or more because they can't use what they already own if we're to have a livable climate. They are between, um, I, I don't know, shale rock and, and uh, a hard drilling platform mm -hmm. in terms of not being able and willing to recognize that they're operating a business model that is not sustainable for the planet. Um, the only sustainability they're concerned about is their bank account. Well, and at least, you know, at least to watch, to see what it looks like anyway. I, I was in Colorado um, uh, last summer when um, a a uh, a flash fire came up two canyons away from Colorado Springs and 
uh, a 60 mile an hour wind, which was unprecedented for that time of year, um, carried it across across those canyons and into uh, a suburb or a portion of Colorado Springs that had been built into the forest interface. And 350 half million dollar homes um, were burned um, in a matter of hours. The fire chief said they couldn't have stopped it if they had rigs on those streets, much less trying to get to it after, after it actually started. Two people died. Uh, most people were able to get out. I mean, they, they saw the flames coming, they, the, the emergency. Yeah, you, could, you could probably but, hear it coming. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, smoke all through the Front Range. Uh, it was just money is not going to protect people from what we're doing to ourselves and to our planet. Mm -hmm. But there's hope. I mean, there is possibility. The, you know, locavore work on agriculture and, and um, people caring about uh, farmers markets and uh, local community markets trying to change away from a corporate and industrial model for food. Protection of our water uh, from industrial takeover attempts, which we've taken a, a two steps on over the last two years uh, in terms of bull run water and, 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 and there's a lot more that needs to be done. But food, water, shelter, looking at housing in a way that uh, makes green building the standard um, at all times. I mean, there was a, I live in North Portland, there was a skinny house put up there um, in my neighborhood a couple years ago where they, they still put in an 80% furnace. You can get a 98% furnace now in terms of effectiveness. And I, I suspect that the insulation and so on was, was weak on the same level. The city should not be permitting that to be done. Uh, and so we can take the political step from our local, I mean, you don't buy houses very often, you don't buy cars very often. But you can talk to, we can talk to our, our, our city council members, we can talk to uh, the mayor, uh, we, we can push as a community, as the 99%, to make a difference on these political actions that both show a path, make a small tangible difference in terms of what needs to be done, and give us hope and a model for the future that we can lead to other people. Mm -hmm. Well, like, like it's, it's, it's been very skillfully said in the past, if the people lead, the leaders will follow. Exactly. And that's exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Is it obviously the leaders are all uh, locked into their, to their whatever it is, their campaign uh, contributions or their their need to uh, please their the people who have helped them get elected in the past for for whatever reason. Uh, that that needs to be broken, and and uh, enough, it's going to take a large amount of people moving in the right direction in a lot of different ways. It seems like it's what you're talking about. I think, I think that's clearly true. Um, and so my friend Barbara Ford's um, advice, you know, do everything you can do in your own life, but don't agonize about the fact that you can't change everything. And if everyone does that, a lot of things will change. Mm -hmm. And probably pretty quickly, too. I think things can... So one of the things we've learned, exam for example, in, in terms of the climate crisis, is that the, the United Nations um, assessors, the IPCC, they've always done a, a three, three lines on a chart approach to this. Uh, so, you know, if we're lucky, here's how it's going to go. Um, here's what we think is going to happen, and here's, here's the worst case. Well, everything that has happened now over the last 20 to 30 years for which we have really good data <laughs> has always been, been on the worst case, case line. They've always been too mm -hmm. conservative. So things are getting hotter faster, storms are getting bigger faster. The oceans are coming up faster. The oceans are coming up faster. Droughts um, and heat waves, which are the big killers. Droughts cause famines. Um, heat waves are direct killers, uh, are happening more and more. You know, there was a, a heat wave um, over France um, in 2003. That I remember that. It got almost no press in the U.S. It Good killed for you. a lot of people. It, at the time, they thought it killed 30,000 people. I don't remember that. <laughs> well, that's what they thought at the time, based on people showing up in the emergency room. My gosh. But since then, there's been a statistical anal analysis of, of a longer period of time and what happened, because um, <laughs> this comes out of the insurance in industry, the actuarial tables. Mm -hmm. Uh, they can do an excess death analysis and look at a big event like that and compare it 
to what would have happened normally otherwise. And they now believe that there were 75,000 excess deaths in France out of that heat wave. Well, that's one of the reasons the European Union has been so vigorous on climate issues for the last 15 years. Now, they're backsliding because of Ukraine, because of the, um, <coughs> the corporate trade deals that we're dealing with, TPP mm -hmm. uh, and TTIP, the European one, uh, where fossil fuels from the United States would be really fair game for uh, the corporate chieftains of other parts of the world. Uh, and I know that's uh, an area that you've spent time on and, and focused on. It's, it's the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The Trans-Pacific yeah. Partnership. Um, NAFTA on steroids. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We cover 40% of the global economy, and that does not include China. Uh, well, then they are not a party to it. They're not a party to it? But Yet. They, but they can be, yeah, because there's other, other countries can come in. Exactly. Uh, and it's clear, I think, that the, I'd be interested to hear how you're, how you're perceiving this at this point, but that this, this so-called free trade model um, is, is a broken model, just like the fossil fuels model is a broken model. Mm -hmm. um, that it, it really is corporate trade and that these humongous mega deals don't make sense in terms of actually trying to develop ways for people to exchange goods and services uh, based on skills and resources with some level of fairness or equity across borders. I mean, theoretically, there ought to be a way to do that. But this sure as hell isn't it. No, I mean, it, it's obvious. Like, you use the right word. It, it, it's, it's, it's a corporate, but it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't give any credence or any, any accountability to the communities. Whether it's the, whether it's the uh, environment in those communities or the labor, all right. of those, right. they're, they're just you know they're, they're, those considerations are way down here, and the corporate profit considerations, and you know, and and the, and the considerations of the jobs that they can give people are, are way up here. Right. But those are usually not uh, those jobs are usually aren't very well paying jobs, and right. it, it just seems to me that. Uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and uh, I didn't heard about this one in Europe, but you know, it's, it's basically it's on the, the same, same deal. Mo it's same a, it's model is probably what thirty thousand pages or five thousand pages, and will nobody be when done and nobody it. can see any of them. Right, it's same it's, thing. It's completely secret. You know, trust us. Uh, yeah. we're, we're, our corp we're your corporations. We're here to help you. Yeah, we brought you the Exxon Valdez. We brought you, the, you know, the uh, what was the name of that one out in the Gulf? That uh, BP Horizon. The BP. Yeah, we brought you all these things, and uh, but we still should trust them. Yeah, well, what I could possibly go wrong? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you know we, we we've kind of nailed down a lot about uh, the problems with with uh, the fracking and, and the natural gas. Now you've mentioned that uh, a lot of this is supposed to come through the Northwest. Now how is that how is that being proposed? <coughs> well, the deal is that Oregon has the weakest environmental laws on the West Coast. I mean, we like to think that we're all green, um, but uh, in fact. Washington and California both have a state version of the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, which is where environmental impact statements come from, where they're required and so on, where so many destructive and crazy projects have been able to be stopped by people mm -hmm. saying, okay, show us the science, show us the facts sure. in detail, and then either um, in court or legislatively been able to show that they were wrong. That's how forest so activists have <laughs> shut down a lot of timber sales. To exactly. The, to the exactly. Nepa, to NEPA. Um, so we don't have a state equivalent of that in Oregon. So uh, we're the weak sibling here. And so there are two proposals. There were three. And one went bankrupt. We were able to stop it. Um, but there are That's two the proposals. That's the one in Astoria? It was, yeah, outside of Astoria called Bradwood Landing in right. the Columbia River. Um, but there's still another one right there. And then there's one on the south coast at Coos Bay. So the one in, on the north coast, inside the mouth of the Columbia River, uh, the second most dangerous bar um, on the planet uh, in terms of moving ships across really? it, requires after Shanghai, uh, uh, requires all these specialty captains who get flown in and out by helicopter. Uh, who know the Columbia just, Bar. Just to run that gauntlet. Just to run that gauntlet <laughs> yeah. with these, I mean, this huge, huge river. Um, and those are huge ships. And those are huge ships. Yeah. Uh, 
so just inside the mouth a few miles, Young's Bay, Astoria on one side and Warrenton on the other side, uh, there's an area um, of dredged uh, spoils from the Skippinon River and the Columbia River there that's been sitting for a hundred years. Uh, it's part of the town of Warrenton and that's where they would put this massive industrial liquefied natural gas uh, terminal to liquef gasification to liquefy plant. It. Exactly. The gas would come from the Rocky Mountains and from Canada and they proposed new pipelines running from the Canadian border down to Woodland, Washington underneath the Columbia River for a mile, what could possibly go wrong with that? Mm -hmm. And then across Columbia and Clatsop counties across northwestern Oregon to Warrenton. Um, that makes Palomar look small <coughs> potatoes. These are three feet in diameter pipelines. They're explosive. Uh, they, they come in 20-foot sections uh, and are, they put sensors on them every 25 miles. Uh, there have been a lot of explosions on these kinds of pipelines at, at, at different times. I think, I think they're really dangerous. There's, we hear all the time about gas explosions in individual homes and in communities. There was a big one in San Bruno, California a few years ago that killed eight people. And then last, last spring there was one in New York City that took out two, uh, two buildings in Harlem. Um, so they, they are uh, very dangerous. Uh, the Clatsop County Commissioners uh, have voted uh, five to zero that the health and safety proposals uh, for the pipelines to feed this terminal are not up to snuff um, and should be rejected by the state and the federal government. Um, so far the state's sitting on that. They've done multiple extensions of time to this consider it. This is Washington it. State? No, no, this is Oregon. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> Because our environmental laws are so weak in Oregon, um, we in the environmental community and uh, the people in these communities that are concerned about these things and people who see the insanity of destroying the global climate uh, and the agriculture that we all depend on uh, from that are stuck with fighting these um, piecemeal agency by agency and um, mm -hmm. permit by permit, which is a, a much tougher way to go. I mean, in Washington State, uh, for the coal terminals that are proposed there, for example, uh, Governor Inslee was able to mandate to his State Department of Ecology that they would consider the climate impacts in their analysis. Now, it's still a step-by-step -step process, but it's holistic. It's comprehensive. It's systemic, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And it's going to take them some, some time, but we'll see just as we can with a national project, like the forest sale issues you talked about, mm -hmm. we'll see if they did a decent job of actually considering the climate impacts of shipping coal out of Wyoming and Montana to China and burning it there. Um, and if they do, it'll be clear that that is a crazy way to deal with the challenge that we have. Of course, you know, uh, didn't, didn't doesn't some government agency just come out recently about uh, the uh, Keystone Pipeline saying oh, there was not going to be any problem with it, something to that effect? I, I, I think what they actually said, this was cute, this was uh, the U.S. State Department uh, had to do the environmental impact statement right. on it. And what they said is that if everything else in the, in the energy market continues as it is now, the effect of Keystone won't be that big. Mm -hmm. So if we keep on going down this path toward destruction that we're on, then why not toss in Keystone too? And we should have a party because, I mean, <laughs> you know, I've, I've got. So a, that's really what they were saying. Then. Yeah, exactly. And in, in so many words, they did do an alternative. If other projects, if if the energy market changes, and if we move into a future of renewables, then Keystone is a problem. It mm -hmm. is a big deal. It does contribute a lot to climate change, uh, if it's built. So, so basically, if you got you got thirty or forty oil spills going on in different parts of the country, one more right. ain't going to hurt anything. Right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. That that was exactly the policy the position they took. No, and kind of, of course, that kind of got us off a little bit. But still, we're talking about uh, an agency in Washington possibly coming up with some kind of same sleight of hand too. 
Possibly. Uh, there, there is some serious risk on that um, because, I mean... I'm usually pretty cynical about government agencies. <laughs> well, I'm afraid that's well earned. I, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's um, true. I, uh, my, uh, my elder daughter survived high school uh, because of her drama club, which whose motto was uh, putting the fun back into dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. <laughs> so watching Washington, D.C. is fun on that exact same level. Mm -hmm. Dysfunctional. Sure. So I think the action in terms of making change really is state and local. I think that's what we need to be focusing on mm -hmm. uh, uh, for our communities and, and our loved ones. Well, I mean, it's, it's worked pretty good around here when we stopped quite a bit of it. We have, things. and I think we can do more because I think people are getting it increasingly. You know, this, this challenge, I alluded to this earlier, is that we all know that it's a problem and we all know that we're using fossil fuels all the time. And so how do we deal with that conundrum? How do we deal with that, that double think, as George Orwell put it, the, the ability to hold two mutually contradictory ideas in your head at the same time? And we all do it. And I think, but I think the two steps on that are first, do what you can in your own life and take the political steps to cut down these new infrastructure proce projects because they can all be replaced with renewables. Mm -hmm. They can all be... and and conservation and efficiency, and you, you, you um, alluded to co conservation earlier, and that's really important. That seems to be, and I would have never thought it could have been that that, that good, but apparently they, like 30, 40 percent. Exactly. You know, I yeah, like, it's yeah, huge. It's, it's huge. Uh, and when, I mean, when, when oil was, was seven, ten, eleven dollars a barrel, Nobody cared. Why bother? I mean, when gasoline was 25 cents a gallon at the pump, when you and I were, sure. were kids back, back before the, the dawn of Neanderthal time. Well, that's the, uh, that's the one half of it. You know, half of it is always the, the, the issue of the environmental damage, which isn't much uh, until you get population. And then that, you know, I know Sierra Club is really involved with population issues, too, as well. Has been. Has been. It's certainly one that, that, that we care about. It turns out that... Um, by far the best way to deal with uh, population problems is to empower and educate women. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where the decision making needs to be. Uh, maybe that's part of what the, 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 the extreme right wing is so, I don't know what the word you'd use, so bad in, on women issues. They just want to disempower them completely. And well, I, I don't know. I'm going to try to come up with a really bad joke here. Uh oh, here we go. <laughs> fresh. So, if your hobby is controlling women, then your lobby on the Supreme Court <laughs> is very effective with the five Catholic men mm. who made that decision. Yeah, that's true. And I don't know. That hobby who, lobby decision. I, I know that Congress, I guess by the Democrats in the Congress, are, are, are going to try to do something about that. And I don't know how they're going to do that since it's been decide about the Supreme Court. I always thought that was a final. Maybe Roosevelt's idea in the 30s, pack the court. Pack maybe. the court. And he, yeah, so, yeah. But again, the federal government is dysfunctional on many levels. It's not unimportant. There are a lot of things that can happen and do happen. I mean, President Obama could be designating national monuments um, based on the Antiquities Act without asking permission and protect a tremendous amount of public lands that would provide all sorts of health and opportunity for the planet and the people and the other species of the planet going mm -hmm. forward. And block some of these areas that they want to frack in. Exactly. I mean, there is fracking on public lands now, and mm -hmm. that could be stopped. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that could be done, and like you're saying, everybody, we, we mentioned this on this show quite a bit, especially when we're talking about energy. Everybody can do something, and, and, a, right. lot, and a lot of what they can do is going to take a little bit of critical thinking, and I know we're not trained to think critically. Uh, we're certainly not trained to think critically when it comes to, uh, to uh, uh, watching our media, because most people, you know, they're busy, they go about their life, and they take they just take at face value what they see on the media, and they don't dig into the significance of, of what they're seeing. Uh, I, I, nothing makes me madder than these energy company commercials, like that uh, thin blonde woman that comes on <laughs> talking about how great the, uh, the, ener the energy is that they're producing, and they're giving these jobs, and it's so safe, and... Then you watch Rachel Maddow, who's just in some nights, she'll go on just enumerating all these oil spills. You know, I'd, I'd like to do some kind of juxtaposition between those two. But uh, it's, it, 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 it's, it's really 
important and it's it's very necessary for folks to to um, watch the news and watch TV and uh, and realize that there's stuff being spun there. They don't even realize they're being spun. That thing keeps popping up up there. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> is uh, is uh, is there anything else you wanted to do? Well, we're down to like seven or eight minutes here. So yeah, was there I, anything else you wanted to bring on? So I have, went I, off I have a, a whole riff on what's wrong with LNG, and we've we've done a lot of that here verbally. Um, right. Uh, New, no new fossil fuel f infrastructure of any kind really is where we Stop need to digging, go. Stop digging, yeah. <laughs> Stop digging. Um, <coughs> it, here's one that shows where they're uh, expecting, okay, I can actually get the whole thing on. All right. Where they're Good expecting. Good job. The, <laughs> Good camera work. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, the use of refinery gas. Remember, that's gas that is pure 100% methane. Uh, to 600 go. times more powerful or whatever Well, that's if it's liquefied, but just anything out of a refinery, that, oh, okay. whether it's been regasified. But in terms of United States use um, at this point, the top red line is industrial. The blue line that's rising so steeply across here um, is electric power. And that's, if, if you look from here um, in the, uh, around 2000 to 2012 and the, the steep growth there, that's coal plants that are being replaced with natural gas baseload power and peaking power plants. Mm -hmm. Residential is actually projected to be down a little bit, commercial up a little bit, transportation up a tiny bit where um, gas would be used, commercial, uh, compressed natural gas could be used for long haul trucking, things like that. But <coughs> there is no excuse for using a fossil fuel for new electric power because we can do it with photovoltaics and wind and smart grids and all of those technologies are well developed and continuing to develop more strongly. Transportation is a little tougher. Gas for residences is tougher. I mean you can fix my house for electricity without me doing anything by fixing the grid uh, and developing utility scale or regional or neighborhood decentralized uh, alternative renewable electric power with, with wind and, and photovoltaics. But if I want to stop using natural gas, I have to change my stove, I have to change my furnace, um, and replace them with um, electric models, and I have to change out the electrical panel to cover the additional load. So my house has to be touched to do that. But that's not the big one that, that's the issue in terms of fracking. It's new electrical power plants um, that would be based on natural gas because it is cheaper than coal. And that's not the direction we need to go. Um, I mean, we're shutting down the Boardman power plant. I'm just going to ask about that, yeah. But, yeah. but PGE is proposing to, and in the process of, they are in construction, to replace that with natural gas, and then they're proposing uh, a partial replacement as well with um, a biomass stock uh, that they want to use that looks like a really dicey, it's an invasive species that they want to start planting in great detail. I haven't studied it, but my understanding well, that would is that... would be methane that, then, wouldn't it? Well, no, they, they want to burn it um, to in oh, a, as, for heat. as a biomass. Yeah. Um, as a biomass product to run turbines to make electricity, mm -hmm. uh, s spin the turbines with the uh, the heat. Well, it's so better than building a nuclear power plant, I guess. <laughs> maybe, <I'm, laughs> yeah. That's, that's, yeah. I mean, the point is that that comparing comparing using natural gas to using coal or using oil is like comparing lymphoma to melanoma to lung cancer. Mm -hmm. I mean. One of them may get you sooner, but they're all going to get you, mm -hmm. or at least damage you so severely that your life will never be the same. Yeah, and, and that is just that is just for thinking how it's going to affect one person. Whereas, you know, the, the the repercussions of those go beyond one person's lymphoma or one person's that's true you know, kidney cancer. I mean, and, and you know, like we've talked about bringing this cold through this country you know, the, the, to the northwest or the oil or all that. That's going to be going overseas and being burned over there, and it's going to be making people over there sick. It's going to come into the air and come over here as well. 
So it it, uh, it it it's 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 a planetary issue. It isn't just a Northwest issue or a no, it's United crazy. States issue, and and uh, it's never framed that way. Well, the the bumper sticker "Think Global, Think <laughs> Globally, Act locally, locally" actually needs to be "Think Globally and Act Globally" and "Think Locally and Act Locally." Act locally. I mean, both both end. Mm -hmm. uh, let me do one minute here in, in our final couple. You got a minute and a half, so you're on, in. On uh, it went quick. <laughs> on the other project. Okay. Um, on, which is on the south coast is at Coos Bay. There's a 234 mile pipeline proposal from near Klamath Falls, Mallon, Oregon, that would run across um, four counties and the coast range, some of the most rugged parts of the coast range, uh, down into Coos Bay they, where they would build this huge terminal um, on a sand spit uh, uh, to liquefy the gas and then ship it out uh, mm -hmm. to Asia. And it's called Jordan Cove. It's a little farther along, actually, than the Warrenton uh, proposal, which is called Oregon LNG. Uh, and it's gotten strong editorial endorsement from uh, the corporate media, the Oregonian. Mm, um, always. And, <laughs> and it's a major plus for the building trades um, in, uh, in terms of the labor movement because the money is there. I mean, I, I talked to a, a labor guy, uh, a friend who said, I'd like to think if you gave my guys a chance to do jobs that save the earth and do jobs that destroy the earth, they'd pick the first ones. Mm -hmm. But nobody's given them that chance. No. And that's what we need to do. We need to replace these destructive projects with healthy projects. And that, and that sounds like a terrible one over there. I know that uh, it, it seems like it's, 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 it's had an easier go than the ones up here. It has, and that's what's so dangerous about it. Coos Bay is an old industrial port city, um, and the Democrats who uh, hold office there are strongly in support of this, mm -hmm. unlike in Clatsop County. I wish we'd have had more time. We're down to like 45 seconds. Did you just discuss a little bit about the footprint of these enormous in places that they're going uh, to be reducing that down to 200 and some odd degrees? <coughs> You know, with 30 seconds left, we can't talk about that. But it's they're enormous. These they things are, they are they and they are huge industrial plants, and they're and they're dangerous <coughs> just in themselves. As they well. are indeed, especially in the biggest earthquake zone in North America. That's true. Oh, well, we're down to 15 seconds. I want to thank the crew. We uh, didn't have time for phone calls, but uh, there was a lot of good information here. I hope folks took this to heart, and uh, maybe catch it on replay. And uh, there's a lot to be uh, learned here. Good night for now.